Good morning. Good morning. It's so wonderful to see you all this morning. Happy 4th of July. It's not quite there, but happy 4th of July weekend. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you and to be with those online. I did. Uh, just so they know, I did walk around and look at the screen so I could see their faces. <laughs> uh, and uh, but it's it's a delight to be with you. Uh, although this does create this sense of great distance. <laughs> there's no, you know, there's I've got Zoom up close to me, but uh, but the rest of the group is far, far away. Uh, we, we don't want you to feel that. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, I think we removed a couple of rows back. Maybe we did that just keep pushing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted to be with you. We, we were uh, told that uh, we should talk about whatever we were interested in. So uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about Bible study and faith formation. And, and, you know, I don't know whether I'll make a whole lot of sense to you, but I hope I'll, I'll have at least a few things to say that maybe prick your ears. Uh, we're going to start, I'm going to talk mainly from three books. The first one is going to be um, a book by Marjorie Thompson called Soul Feast. And we will start with a verse of scripture and a word of prayer. Uh, as she starts in the second chapter, which she calls Chewing the Bread of the Word, Psalm 19, verses 7 and 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to chew on your word, we pray that you would sweeten the word you speak to us, that you would, in fact, by your spirit, speak to us this day and reawaken in us the faith that has come to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. So I, I told Carol Simmons I was going to have to uh, begin with Carol this morning. Um, Years ago, and I won't say how many years ago, uh, she taught Soul Feast, uh, an invitation to the Christian spiritual life by Marjorie Thompson, and, and I happened to be in the class, and it was wonderful, and uh, it conveyed to me some understanding of uh, some, some language about talking about Bible study that I want to borrow today, which is why Bible study and faith formation, Christian formation, are so important um, as I think about it. So I'm going to be talking about just the principles that I use for Bible study, and, and I said that to someone, and they said, well, that doesn't sound all that exciting. We all do Bible study all the time. <laughs> So here's the key. I want, I want you to understand Bible study as faith formation, Christian formation. Um, so, so to begin with, um, how often do you think of reading the Bible as tasting the honey? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't see a whole lot of hands just jump up right there. Uh, the, script, the scripture says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. Well, you know, you don't think of laws as reviving the soul. I guess this should have the 
professor saying up here. So, so law in the Old Testament refers to the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. He's talking about, or the author here is talking about reading scripture, Bible study, as faith formation. That is, what is going on as we read scripture, it, it shouldn't be like reading a book of law if you're in law school. Well, although for some, perhaps that would be very exciting and, and, and life-giving. But, um, but for most of us, when we're reading the Bible and thinking about law, it's we're not thinking about sweet as the honeycomb and the drippings of the honeycomb. Marjorie Thompson uh, begins her book, uh, the, the section of the book, in talking about comparing scripture reading, spiritual reading, and other kinds of reading. She says, she says uh, you know what it's like if you pick up the newspaper. Maybe that's a little bit like reading law uh, to some of us. Uh, I mean, why do we read the newspaper? Catch up. To catch up. We are reading for the latest information about what's going on in the world. And maybe there are a few tidbits thrown in. We're following our favorite team, but we're still looking for information. What was the trade last night? You know, who? Who has been signed as a free agent? Uh, what's the possibility for the season? And what conversation do I need to prepare for tomorrow morning in Sunday school? Uh, we're looking for information if we're reading the newspaper. It may be anything from war, uh, world events to sports. Uh, and maybe we get a little bit of delight uh, if we read the comments. Uh, but but mostly it's information. But let's say on the other hand, we receive a letter. Now, I got to say that the book is a little bit older. Uh, it was originally written a few years ago. So people actually wrote letters then. Uh, so, so let's say you get a letter in the mail. Let's imagine that you actually got a handwritten letter in the mail. I mean, would you, would you, from a friend that you haven't talked to for a while, would you approach that the way you do the newspaper? No. Why? Because you know that and you want to hear about what's going on. Or I would. So, so there's a relationship involved in reading a letter from someone. We are approaching this uh this letter in a different way where we want to know what's going on with them, what's uh, what's been happening with the children, with the family, the pets, you know, where the, so. We are not merely seeking information, but formation. That is, we are entering into a relationship we expect there to be an emotional impact in their words on us. Which is the difference between reading the newspaper and doing Bible study. That we are entering into a relationship with God. With the source of scripture, uh, we are seeking to be formed by God's word to us. Uh, as we read scripture. Now, I, I, I say that knowing that a lot of people, anyone who's been in a Bible study with me, feels like they get a lot of information. Uh, I, well, not a lot, but some information. I, I tend to lead with information about the Bible. But always in the back of my mind is Carol Simmons saying, it's, it's uh, we're seeking not merely information, but formation. Bible study, according to Marjorie Thompson and Carol Simmons, is about formation. Um, yes, we, we come to, to Scripture with questions, 
But, well, even scripture itself tells us, uh, Paul tells his converts in Rome, do not be conformed to the word, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's what Bible study should be a part of. Being transformed by the renewal of our minds as we encounter the author of the letter as we study scripture. Even, even if we're digging into the deep history or uh, the exegesis of particular passages, we want to encounter the author of the, of the writing. Thompson quotes also from Paul's letter to the Philippians, where we are encouraged to have the mind of Christ in ourselves. No, it didn't. That, that affects our transformation. It affects how we are shaped and transformed in our spiritual life. So, so reading scripture, uh, she talks about as one form, not the only form, of spiritual reading. There are other disciplines, there are other books, there are other uh, sources, there, you know, it can be it can be movies, it can be Art. It can be, there are different things that we can encounter in our uh, meditative, spiritual uh, seeking, but reading scripture should always be not just for information, but for formation. Looking to see what I may have skipped. Okay, okay. In fact, Thompson at this point quotes, uh, and, and you have to throw this in because it's a Presbyterian class, uh, quotes from John Calvin <clears throat> and says, Hence, if we seriously aspire to the pure contemplation of God, we must come, I say, to the Word where God is truly and vividly described to us. That is, uh, at part of the heart of our tradition from Calvin forward is this understanding that scripture is about encounter. Even though he was one of those who gave us lots of information about scripture, who uh, sought to dig out the Greek, the Hebrew, text, the historical context, and, and present that to us. Nonetheless, it was always about encountering God. It is where God is described for us. So we're going to switch authors for a moment. I guess I should ask, is that just old hat to you? Uh, have you encountered that? I mean, you, I mean, if you, I know you've been taught by Carol before. Uh, <clears throat> it resonates with you when you think about it as when you think about Bible study as formation. I think the part that resonates with me, Randy, is approaching the Bible is like going to obey, going to a baseball game or a basketball game. I can watch it on the surface and it can be entertaining. But the more I understand, the richer and deeper it becomes. And there are so many layers to it that you have to interact with it over and over and gain a deeper understanding to really get to the formational pieces. Does that make sense? Oh, I, I, well, I agree. Thank you very much. So I, so I just come up here and, and hold forth for a few minutes. Uh, yes, it, so it does require digging deeply, um, and, and that's something that I really, that I value tremendously in terms of study. Yes, ma'am. So another thing is that Paul says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Not 
Yes. There, there is the conviction that that as we read and study uh, in Christian community, uh, which is in my notes for later, but it, as we read and study in the Christian community, the Spirit of God is leading us and encountering us. Margie. Ah. Yes. <laughs> You're going from the old self to the new self. So it's like they say it's, it is a train. You're going up to a transmit to a cross. You're crossing from the old to the new. And, and you've got, and there has to be some way to get there. And you got the word of God, you got the spirit to give you, guide you through all this. And, you know, it's like, uh, you said, but, and you have the Lord to open your mind to the scriptures. So, you, you know, it is like you say, an encounter, not just a do it yourself thing. So, we began in this community this morning with scripture and prayer. That God would, would God would encounter us. Um, okay, so you're you're anticipating a lot of where I'm going already, so I'll just give you credit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so who's <laughs> Gonzalez says pretty much the same thing. We do not read and study the Bible only to be informed, but also and above all to be formed. Now I because I have the books in front of me, I know that. She wrote before he did, but Husto was actually one of uh, one of uh, my uh, old uh, church history professors while I was in seminary, and now that's that's way before I knew Carol. Uh, and, uh, and and actually, his wife was my my, old, my uh, history professor. But she would bring him in because he was a, a more noted scholar and he had written that. He had literally written the book that we were using and uh, called The uh, uh, History of the Christian Church. And, um, and so he would come in and do the lectures that she didn't like to do. Uh, but through the years, he has written some other things. He's written some interesting Bible studies. Uh, Used this a few years ago, three months with Matthew, um, where he talks about uh, his approach to Bible study and, and what he's trying to lay out for us in this book. Uh, and he compares it to exercise. That is, if, if we want to be healthy uh, in our body, we are going to exercise. We are going to the gym. We are going to lift some weights, do some things. But he says we don't lift weights to find out just how much we can lift. We lift so we can lift more the next time around. <clears throat> um, we dig deeper each time we go. We, we develop uh, in our ability to uh, Exercise, we develop in study in our ability to encounter God's word. We grow, uh, we are formed in that encounter. So Husto has a particular uh, schematic that he uses in, in this book and in other books about studying scripture which uh, is step one is seeing, step two is judging, step three is acting. Um, it begins by saying it requires discipline. Uh, as you might expect, and I'm sure you've heard before, he encourages you to have time where you study uh, so that there is a regularity to it and you don't just skip over it. 
you know, well, I did it at seven o'clock this morning. I'll do it at seven o'clock tonight. Whoops, I forgot to do it yesterday. And he's trying to get people through his book, right? So he's saying, we're going to do this in three months. Three months with Matthew. This is a study. Uh, he also has one on John. He has one on the Acts. Um, but his approach is, uh, okay, you missed yesterday. You don't miss today. If you, if you take a day off from the gym, that's okay. You get a recovery day, and you go back to the gym the next day. Uh, so here's his approach. Uh, take time. Give yourself a place to study regularly. Always begin with prayer. That's inviting the Spirit in to transform us, to be involved, so that God is always present in our Bible study. It's about, it's not about just reading a book for information. It's about faith formation. And there is reflection, which he says might ideally include another group of Christians to sit and reflect with uh, so that we are always reading in community. Uh, quick, quick words about these steps. C. Well, okay, we, we've already talked about digging deep. Uh, we ask what is it about? Who's written? What's it about? Where is this particular scene in Scripture? Why is it? What is it? Is, is, it, is it a poem? Is it a love letter? There are some very loving letters from Paul, and there are some scathing letters from Paul. It's important to know where we are. Uh, Paul's writing to us from prison. How does that shape what he's writing? Um, one of my, my fascinating, one of the things that's fascinated me through years of study is to discover uh, that um, if you dig deeply enough and you work on Genesis 1, you discover it's probably one of the last things written in the Old Testament rather than the first thing written in the Old Testament. Um, Genesis 1 talks about the greater light and the lesser light. And you go, wow, so primitive they don't even know sun and moon. No, it's as you dig into it, you begin to discover that probably written in Babylon, where to say sun and moon were names for gods. And so the Jewish writer wasn't going to name another god. So they just talked about the greater light and the lesser light. Everyone got it. You just don't use those names of other gods in Scripture. Uh, we dig into it. So we have, to, we have to have a method for seeing what's in front of us. It's complicated. There are Scriptures of all kinds, history, poetry, um, liturgical forms, psalms, uh, songs. We have to be able to identify what it is that we're looking at. We have to see the text for what it is. That's step one. Two, judgment. Now, this is one of those interesting ones because for the most part, we think about scripture as building a case. That's the information approach. If we learn enough about what scriptures has to say about something over here, then we know what to say about something over here. So, you know, we, we try to figure out, well, is it okay for us to go to those football games on Sunday afternoon? We won't get into that. <laughs> uh, but we build a case in scripture about, that tells us about how to do something or what what is the scriptural position about something over here? As faith formation, as Christian formation, the question is at rather what, how does scripture judge us? What is it in this text that is judging us? 
that is suggesting maybe we need to change something about our own lives, about our own selves. Um, Marjorie Thompson <clears throat> has a great way of saying this. In a certain sense, we are engaged in scriptural reading. When we are engaged in scriptural reading, it is not so much we who read the word as the word reads us. The word reads us. The word tells us something about our lot. So instead, at this point, we are talking about scriptural reading, spiritual reading, not so much to build a case, which is going back to the information gathering, and there's a place for that, but here we are talking about how do we, I was told when I started seminary, and was, we began to learn about preaching, how do we stand under the text? What does the text say to our lives as the preacher? And if we don't know that, we're not ready to preach the text. We tend not to approach scripture reading to see how it judges us. We see how it judges the world, <clears throat> those around us. It's, it's real easy. I mean, I, Wednesday mornings, I do my Bible study. And you go, wow, this is just like what's going on in the world today. Yes, it is. But where are we in the text? And, it, and every now and then, uh, N.T. Ryder, writer that we've been using recently, will say, what does this say to your church? And it's like, well, next page. Uh, you know, we, <clears throat> how does it judge us? And uh, so if you're going to read Gustav Gonzalez for three months, he's going to ask you how you've been judged by the text day in and day out. Uh, but the third thing is acting. And we've said, I don't know, Tim or someone else said, you know, there is an expectation that we're going to do something. Bible study as Christian formation expects that it will result in action. Now, that doesn't mean, who's uh, uh, says it may not be physical action. It may not be that it convicts you to go down the road and help me ministry and serve a meal. But maybe it will. Uh, maybe it will convince. We had a group of people over at Overton in the last couple of days putting up a swing set, and uh, some folks here were in the hot sun yesterday spreading mulch underneath that swing set so that when the kids are on the swings, they won't get hurt. Uh, maybe, maybe scripture will encourage you to actually do something, or maybe it will form you. Form you somehow shape your life into uh, what Husso says is the obedience to God. He's Methodist, by the way. Uh, you, have, you have to do something. Uh, you can't just think about it. You have to do something. Uh, and, and so his method is you, you, you know, you're doing all these exercises, you're learning how to lift weights and lift heavier objects. Certainly, you're going to do something. You're going to be formed in such a way. You're going to be transformed. You're going to become more like Christ. And Christ was inclined to do something. And so, um, we will eventually, inevitably, if we are really formed by the text, we will act. Gusto cites, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Or maybe it wasn't Gusto, maybe it was Marjorie. Uh, well, can't find it right now. Cites Hebrews. Uh, 
can't quote it off the top of my head. Uh, Word of God is a two edged sword, but that close. Uh, Hebrews 4 12 through 13. I guess I could just look it up. <clears throat> <clears throat> You know, you, you plan all this stuff and you think you're going to switch back and forth quickly. Four, 12, and 13. <clears throat> Instead, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing. Until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, it is able to judge, judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account, be transformed, become more obedient. Judgment is always for action. And therefore, the Christian life, Bible study should lead us into the Christian life. Dig deeper, lead us into the Christian life. Um, what are ways that you've seen that? How have you experienced Every time Trevor ever ever walks into this place, Trevor digs me deeper than I've ever been in certain settings. <clears throat> and it, 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 it's real. He sees things that I never saw. And, and sometimes it's transformational. Like I read the scriptures the wrong way for years and suddenly see it completely different. So that, those are those moments for me. That's why you can't do it on your own. It has to be a shared experience to be able to truly do it. So, as we move along, I think Bible study for me, um, I am digging deeper than I am. Um, learning more about God and my faith, I think for the most part, it just keeps me grounded. The world just pulls me in so many directions, and I need that central to kind of every day be reminded of what's important through Christ versus the world. So, yes, I'm learning a ton, but most importantly, what it does is keep me centered. So those are the last two points, uh, Steve and Rob. Um, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I wasn't involved, I would say sin. I would not say sin. I would right. I have to do it. So. so, so this the, I'm taking this from uh, from a book. Uh, this is actually, like I said, uh, I talk about formation instead of information, but I do read books, and and so this is the Bible study, not just for the fall. This is for next year in my Bible study. Uh, we're going to do a survey on Scripture, the Mighty Acts of God. Uh, originally written, uh, some of you may know the Arnold Rhodes version that was part of Covenant Life curriculum in, in a couple of generations past. It was revised by uh, Eugene March. And, and he has a number of principles of Bible study as we go into this. But the two that I wanted to point to were one. Uh, Interpret the Bible in the covenant community. That is, it's always helpful to have someone like Trevor around. It's always helpful to hear other people's perspective. Um, because we read scripture in community better than we do a lot. Um, although there's some people that seem to read it really well on their own. They go into that, but they, they are the ones who do that. And but but they share it in community. Uh, one of the things about however much scripture reading Trevor does 
it, we would never know it if you didn't share it. So we, Bible study, faith formation occurs in the exchange, in the community, once again, prayerfully in the presence of the Spirit. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's the first principle I want to take from uh, the mighty acts of God. And the second one is what Robin was talking about, interpreting the Bible in the Christian faith. That is, Christ is the center. Christ is the point, the focal point of, uh, of our study. Um, the mighty, in the mighty acts of God, the, the opening is that uh, we've also heard the story that, that the Bible is the greatest story ever told. But we balance that with uh, what... Uh, and I, I've lost Barry. Uh, what Barry sings on Monday, Thursday, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Which is the, the reminder of the invitation to be present in the story. That it is not just the story of what God did, but it's the story of what God did in Christ and continues to do in the church. Which means our lives. Maybe we weren't there, but we enter the story where we are in the community, in our sharing faith, in our trying to decide how the scripture judges us. And then what does it mean about our lives becoming more obedient in what we do? What is it that we do as a result of what we have of what we have learned, of what we have shared together. Um, in the book, they, they, it talks about one instance is, um, is Moses. Uh, uh, for an example, Moses hears the call of God. He is sure he is part of the story, but he hears the call of God. He responds faithfully. He uh, and he experiences he experiences God in the events of his life. This is, I apologize, it's not the clearest, but it is right out of the book. Uh, he experiences God in the events of his life, the burning bush. Uh, in the uh, events, he then has to interpret what it means for his life, and he goes, he does eventually go to Egypt. He becomes the interpreter, and he takes the interpreted events, and he acts on God's behalf. He, he is declared to be God's mouth, which is prophet. Old Testament word for prophet is mouth. He becomes God's mouth, and further events develop where they get interpreted, and we get the exodus. It is interpreted again and again through scripture as God's intervention in the lives of the people, and continues continues roughly 3,500 years to be interpreted every year in the lives of the Jewish community, uh, wherever you are, as they think about the meaning of the Exodus and the Moses encounter with God and the experience of encountering God in the Exodus of what God has done in the community. And they continue to talk about what does that mean in our lives? We do it with the cross. That's point two. We do it in the Christian community. We do it with the cross. That is, God acted in the world in the event of the life of Christ. Um, in the cross, gets interpreted uh, by writers of the New Testament. And then we act on those interpreted events 
that draw us back toward God, and God acts again. And we are caught in this cycle of God acting and in the events of the world, in the events of our lives, in the interpretation of community, and of interpreted events. I mean, that's why, that's why we were in Overton yesterday, spreading mulch, Rip. Who else? I saw a few people. Rip was there. Spreading mulch. Why? Were we doing that just because we thought it was a good idea? Yeah, it didn't seem like such a good idea at the time. I mean, it was hot. Uh, I was late, and it was still hot. Uh, but we did it because we believe that it is in Doug was there. Who else? Doug, who am I missing? Harry. Adams. Adams, one of the Adams. There were a lot of people that weren't here, but uh, that aren't here that were there. But uh, we do these things because we have interpreted Christ's life in our lives in such a way that it, we have to act. We have to act. And we believe that the Christ event is, in fact, the center point of Scripture and the center point of our lives. That's what this diagram is about. And it's a little skewed. Again, I apologize. But we start at the beginning with creation. And at the other end of Scripture is new creation. Adam and Eve yield to a new human kind. Abraham and Israel give us the apostles and the church, or give us the church. The remnant is balanced by the apostles, and Christ is that center point that crosses between Old Testament and New Testament, Old Covenant and New Covenant. Christ is the New Covenant with the new people of God moving us toward the new creation. And so our acts that have been judged, how, however our lives have been formed in the conversation around Scripture, in Christian formation, yields activity in the world that is based on Christ as the center point, not just of the biblical story, but of the story of our lives. Now, if we didn't stand around yesterday talking about Christ as the center point of mulching the uh, playground at Oak. Um, but um, there it is. That we are, we are, in fact, what we do is the result of having interpreted our lives through that center point. And we continue to move out into the world in the new creation. Now there's just, uh, I'm going to pause there and see what thoughts you have. Well, the word is language. And you don't read the word, the word reads you. I like it a lot better than you uh, because judging and judgment is not a term that is necessarily uh, accessible in today's world. Most people view Christians as judging all the time. And so I, I, I like the way she approached it. Um, they're both right. It's just I, I feel one's more accessible in today's world than the other. And when you just laid out what you laid out, Randy, I, I can't help but think the importance of Christianity in this world going forward. And the need for us to continue to spread it because one that doesn't have it is not a role that I want to live in. Uh, Bob walked downstairs this morning and said, Did you hear the first, the, the, the last Indiana Jones is the first one not to have a biblical reference in it? And I'm like, Well, there's the world we're living in. And there's no holy grail. There's no holy grail. But that, 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 that's just a small piece of the fact that. <clears throat> we marginalized a bit, and, and I think the 
importance of that Christian formation and, and the things like Otis. They have to continue for generations, and that's up to us. Sorry. No, no, I well, but that's the point is that um, we are here in community, we are interpreted. We are, I mean, how is it? How is it that the law becomes sweet? Um, it's not, it's not by figuring out which form of a Aorus participle of a particular Greek verb is uh, on the very left. And <coughs> uh, it is because we encounter God in our lives, we come to see more clearly how Christ is still at work in our lives, in our community, and what it is that we can do to be involved in the formation of the church, the new humankind, the new creation. How is it that, how is it that Dwayne uh, going to Mexico is involved in God's new creation? How is it that sweating behind the Overton building to spread mulch is part of God's new creation? But we have to give language to that. And so the language we give is very, very important. Um, so maybe rather than extending this, I will move to the last point. Formation results in obedient action. The, the, the obedient action is, is the Husta language. Love God, and I mistype it, with all your being and your neighbor as yourself. That's where the mighty acts of God is going. That's what Jesus said. Uh, in our interpretation of the Bible, we sometimes begin with the Bible and seek to hear how God speaks to us. Through this process, we have received God's word of judgment and mercy many times. The whole point is the love. The love of God with all your heart, with all your being, and with your neighbor as yourself. Any interpretation worthy of the name of Christian must pass the searching examination of these two commandments. See, there, there's the law. Love. That's where we get when we dig it out. That it's not about Leviticus necessarily. It, although loving neighbor is from Leviticus, it is about loving God and loving neighbor. The law is about love. And any interpretation worthy of the name Christian must pass the searching examination of these two commandments as Jesus presented it. So sometimes when I'm reading a book like this with a group, I have to be reminded that it's not about the information. It's about formation. Formed a little bit, that balances all the information uh, you might gather. Um, we'll still read the book this year. And I will tell people, eh, you don't have to read the book. Uh, I'll come in and talk about the book, but uh, you can read whatever you can read. Um, because the point is that we are formed in Christ. That we are formed in Christian community, that we are formed by the Spirit, that we are formed for acts of Christian love. to say amen at that point. 